This and all talks at the 2019 JavaScript for WordPress conference are brought to you in part by our sponsors Pantheon, a high-performance hosting platform with agile developer tools. Check them out at pantheon.io. Hey, everybody. Welcome to track one. It's JavaScript. My name is Christy Chirinos, and I'm going to be your MC for this track for today, this beautiful July 12th Friday, as we go on and learn about the different things that are on this track. First up today, we have Chris Ferdinandi. Now, Chris Ferdinandi helps people learn vanilla JavaScript. He believes there's a simple, more resilient way to make things for the web. I'm a huge fan. I think your content is super educational. I totally follow you on Twitter. And with that, I will pass it on to you, Chris. Awesome. Yeah, let me um, <clears throat> share my screen and get some slides going, and we can make this thing happen. Perfect. Awesome. So thank you, everyone. Uh, Chris Ferdinandi, I'm going to be talking about the lean web today. Uh, these are some thoughts I've had for a while on how to build a simpler, faster worldwide web. Um, and I believe that right now the web is a bit of a bloated, over-engineered mess. And I believe that a lot of our modern best practices are actually making the web worse. And so what I wanted to talk to you all about today was some ideas I have on how to fix it. And I want to explore a new set of best practices to replace some of the stuff that we do today. Um, and all title for this talk is Old Man Yells at the Cloud. Um, I've been doing this for a while. Um, I can sometimes come across as a little bit um, grumpy to some of the newer ways of doing things. But um, if you've ever felt like modern web development is too complicated, this talk is for you. And if you haven't, I hope that by the end, you'll feel more empathetic to a segment of designers and developers who aren't like you. Um, so uh, as mentioned, I'm Chris Ferdinandi. You can find me online at gomakethings.com. I'm known on the web as the vanilla JS guy. I didn't come up with the term, but I spend a lot of time evangelizing the use of native JavaScript methods and browser APIs instead of libraries and frameworks. I write short guides and create video courses on vanilla JS. I teach people how to build cool projects. And I run a project-based training program called the Vanilla JS Academy. And I've gotten to teach students at some amazing companies like Chobani, TenUp, the Boston Globe. And what's probably the highlight of my career, Apple used one of my open source plugins on the Swift website. Um, I uh, This is really exciting for me because <clears throat> I didn't start my career in web development. I actually started in human resources. And then about six or seven years ago, I taught myself how to code and transitioned over into web development. It's an awesome career move, and I highly recommend it. Um, I'm self-taught, and I started with HTML and CSS within the context of WordPress. Uh, and then I moved over into jQuery, which was the way to use JavaScript on the web at the time. Some frameworks existed, but they weren't really a thing yet. Um, and then I wanted to understand more about how jQuery worked under the hood, and to be honest, feel more like a real developer, quote unquote, because I'm self-taught. Um, because I was trying to get a job in the industry, um, I really felt like a bit of a fraud. I kept going on these job interviews. I knew how to make stuff work in jQuery, but I couldn't explain how or why or what was actually happening in the browser. So I kept failing the JavaScript portions of a lot of my interviews. So I started learning vanilla JavaScript. And at the time, browsers were finally standardizing features and implementations. So cross-browser compatibility was a lot easier than it had been in the past. CSS3 and HTML5 were out. JavaScript's ES5, which pulled a lot of features from jQuery, was also out. And in retrospect, it feels like the perfect time to have tried to learn this stuff. It was this sweet spot where all these amazing things, powerful native features, and ease of use all just kind of came together. I look at the state of things today, and I feel like I wouldn't have been able to teach myself or make the job into web development if I tried to do it today. Um, and I want to help others feel like they can make that same tr uh, transition that I did. So every weekday, I send out a short email with code snippets and tools and techniques, um, kind of detailing some lean web stuff. And everyone who subscribes gets an email from me asking, what's your biggest challenge in web development? I get back a ton of responses, but the one I get back more than anything is some variation of this. My biggest challenge is keeping up. I'd say this accounts for at least 50% of the responses I get back in some form or another. It's not always phrased exactly like this, but this is usually the root of the problem that I hear from most of the folks who respond back. The good news is there's a movement towards simplicity on the web happening. 
Uh, in 2018, Thomas Fuchs tweeted, is there a conference for developers that specifically caters to lean web, don't use JS if not necessary, et cetera? Um, this is the first time I'd seen that term used. Thomas has used it a few times since then. And as far as I know, he's the one who coined it. I really like it and what it embodies. And so that's what I'm gonna be talking to you about today. Um, and this will probably stand in sharp contrast to some of the other tracks that are happening for the rest of the day. A lot of this talk is focused, or a lot of this conference is focused on doing more with JavaScript. And what I'm going to be advocating for is doing less with JavaScript. So um, it'll be interesting just a position for you. Um, you may completely disagree with some of the stuff I'm talking about, and I'd be absolutely happy to talk about some of that too. So uh, here's the agenda for the rest of the talk. I'm gonna spend a good portion talking about modern best practices and why I think they're bad. We're gonna spend just a few minutes looking at how we got here in the first place, and then I'm gonna introduce what I think are a set of new best practices that can guide us forward towards a simpler, faster web. Um, so with that in mind, let's, uh, let's dig into modern best practices and why I think they're bad. If I had to sum up modern web development in one sentence, it would be this, JavaScript all the things. So much of modern web development is built around JavaScript. Sometimes it feels a bit like this. Um, and if you're visually impaired and you're listening to this, um, it's a picture of a waiter pouring a ton of olive oil into a salad. Uh, the waiter is supposed to be a developer, the salad is supposed to be a website, and the giant bottle of olive oil is supposed to be JavaScript. Um, kind of the, the underpinning of all the modern best practices that I see is the use of JavaScript frameworks like Angular and React and Vue. They're listed on almost every front end job description I see. What framework did you use is a pretty common question when someone announces an awesome new project on Twitter. So what's the appeal of these tools? One of the big attractions to frameworks is how they create user interfaces. So let's say you had a had to build a to-do list app and you had some data about the user and their to-do items. And you wanted the UI to look something like this with a field to add to-dos and a list of their items. Completed items would get checked off and struck through. Um, and when they add a new item or complete an item, you need to update the UI. With a traditional DOM manipulation approach, that would require um, when they check off an item, finding that item in the UI and then adding some sort of class to it to create the strike through effect. And when they add a new item, you'd have to find the last item in the list and create a new element and inject it into the DOM after that item. And if they had no to-do items, maybe you want to show a message asking them to add one. And that also changes the way that you would add that first item because there's no existing items to target. So you'd have to do something a little bit different there. And as your app gets bigger and more complex, there's a lot more moving parts you have to manage as you kind of add stuff in and out of the DOM. Frameworks take a different approach. They use something called state-based or data-based UI. You create a template and tell the framework that if your data looks like this, do this. If it looks like that, do something else. So in our case, if we had to do items to display, show them. If there's no to do items, show a message instead. And then rather than updating the UI directly when things change, you update your data source and the framework handles the rest. So for those to do items, you might say, if it's completed, add this class. If it's not, leave it off, for example. Um, and then frameworks take it a step farther and they use a process called diffing to look for differences between the current UI and how it should look, and they only update what's needed. So all of that manual DOM manipulation stuff you used to have to do, the framework just handles behind the scenes. And the only thing you have to worry about is what should the data object look like right now? And based on that, how should the UI look? It's a really smart approach. The big well-known frameworks like React and Vue use something called the virtual DOM too. Uh, this is a JavaScript-based representation of the real UI that it uses to figure out what needs to be updated in the UI when the data changes. So when you're working with really large data sets, um, pinging the DOM or querying the DOM to get a list of all the stuff that's there and what it looks like can get a little bit expensive um, and slow. And keeping that in memory in JavaScript is technically better for performance when you're working with really large amounts of data. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're building apps that perform at scale, this is an often cited benefit of using frameworks. And theoretically, uh, because established frameworks are used by thousands of developers at hundreds or thousands of companies, you have more people testing the code, finding bugs, pushing fixes. The code is more resilient. So you may be thinking, hey, that, that all makes sense. That sounds good. What's wrong with this? Well, 
one of the main arguments for using frameworks is performance, but frameworks also cause a lot of performance problems. We talk about performance at scale a lot when talking about frameworks. This comes up constantly. Well, what about at scale? What about at scale? But these tools were designed by companies who deal with a level of scale that most of us will not. Most of the sites we build don't have Facebook or Twitter sized data bundles um, or kind of user consumption. Most of the sites that we build will never get there either. We like that frameworks have tons of bug fixes baked in, but many of them are fixes for these weird edge cases that we'll never encounter and features that we don't need. We're inheriting solutions to other people's problems, not just ours. And all of that JS that we load for the scale issues and edge case bugs that we don't actually have has a huge impact on performance, particularly first page load. We're sacrificing initial page load performance, our user's first impression with our site or our app for the hopes of faster page loads later. And I'm not sure that that trade-off is worth it. Because of how browsers work, JavaScript is so much worse for performance than similarly sized HTML or CSS are. Adiaz Mani, who's a performance specialist at Google, wrote a great article on why this is the case last year called The Cost of JavaScript. And in it, he wrote that byte for byte, JavaScript is still the most expensive resource that we send to mobile phones because it can delay interactivity in large ways. A few years back, there was a movement called One Less JPEG. The argument was that rather than worrying about 200 to 300 kilobytes of JavaScript, just use one, one less JPEG, maybe that hero image. It's about the same size anyways, and then you can just get on with it. The problem is that it's not just about download size. JavaScript is a lot more demanding to parse and execute. It blocks page rendering. It blocks other files from downloading. So when a browser hits a JavaScript file, it stops other downloads until that file is completed. It can't just be run after the browser receives it. Adi Osmani explains in that same article, it needs to be parsed, compiled, executed. And there are a number of other steps that a rendering engine needs to complete. This brings us to package managers and module bundlers. Because of these large JavaScript bundles um, and the performance issues that they create, we started using package managers and module bundles like Bower and Yard and Webpack and Parcel and Rollup. And um, I absolutely love, love the names for these things. Um, I am terrible at naming things, so I'm always jealous of people who can come up with cool names for projects. Uh, these tools handle dependency management, figuring out what JavaScript files to include on any given page based on what else is there. So rather than loading all the things on every page, you load just the JavaScript you need for that page. And the newer ones also offer a feature called tree shaking. So let's say you load a file that's needed on a page, but it has some code that isn't. They'll actually drop that code out and build a really tiny bundle that has just the stuff you need. This isn't a terrible idea, but the trade-off for this approach is high setup and maintenance costs. Because of all the moving parts and the deep dependency trees with these modern approaches, getting set up in the first place and maintaining that setup can be expensive and time consuming. Getting new developers set up with everything they need to work on your code base becomes a complicated, delicate balance. Sometimes you spend your first week or two on a new job just fighting with terminal and debugging setup processes when all you really wanna be doing is just building cool stuff like you were hired to. And if one of those dependencies somewhere in your chain, and that chain can be really deep, gets out of date, the whole build can come crashing down around you. I've spent hours trying to debug dependency issues before, or just trying to update my dependencies because they became out of date, when all I really wanted to do was just get it set up and start working. These tools that are supposed to help us and save us time often end up costing us more time because of tiny gotchas. Kyle Shevlin tweeted, um, my workflow today was 15 minutes of writing code that works and two hours of trying to appease the static type gods, He's fighting his setup to be able to do what he needs to do. Brad Frost, who's just amazingly talented, talked about how you know th that awful realization when you discover that you could have done in 10 minutes in jQuery what you've spent hours slogging through modern JS frameworks to do. Or Nicole Dominguez, who shared a similar thought about Webpack, um, which turns a one hour project setup into an eight hour affair because of all the issues. Or J.R. Cook, who learned the hard way that not only did Angular not make his project any better, it actually added more complexity that they then had to maintain and deal with. Another popular modern best practice uh, that you see coming out more and more, especially as we move to component-based and React-based kind of world is CSS and JavaScript. 
CSS and JS is supposed to address some of the challenges of working with CSS in a component-based design system on a team of developers who are sometimes more comfortable with JavaScript than CSS. Let's say you had a component styled like this. You've got a call out that has a background color of slate gray and a font size of 2M. There's a good chance that other components in your UI might have a background color of slate gray or font size of 2M2. And over time, you'll start to see more and more of this sort of thing as your code base grows, where you'll have a lot of redundancy, a lot of redeclared properties on all these different components within your code base. There's also a chance you might create a component with some styles, and then later that component gets dropped out of the project, but you forget to remove the styles, which adds even more bloat. In CSS and JavaScript, you do something like this instead. It looks pretty similar, but it uses JavaScript conventions instead of CSS ones. So this works in a framework-based system where the markup is being created with JavaScript. So you can declare the styles for that component right within the JavaScript file. And then when this gets rendered out into an actual web page, it looks something like this. And the idea here is that each of those properties, the background color of slate gray, the font size of 2M, gets broken down into its own class and added to the element. Any other elements on that page that have the same styles get those same classes applied. So instead of you know, the same properties being declared over and over again for all of these different things, um, JavaScript is dynamically creating a style sheet for you and adding classes to all the elements that need them. And because those styles are tied to the component, if that component ever gets dropped out of the project, the styles that go along with it do too. Um, you're only loading what's needed for the page and you're avoiding issues with the cascade trickling down and conflicting with other elements. Um, Nicholas Gallagher, uh, formerly of Twitter Engineering, shared some data about their move away from their legacy code base to a CSS and JS solution, saying that their old legacy CSS file was 630 kilobytes. Their new one that's dynamically generated in real time is just 30 kilobytes. These results are really impressive, but I can't help but feel like 630 kilobytes is just an unnecessarily large amount of CSS for, in particular, for what the Twitter UI was at the time, but for any website, really. That's just a really large amount of CSS. Um, and as we'll see in a little bit, the resulting code from their progressive web app is effectively the same as some other purely CSS-based techniques, but with a ton of extra tooling and fragility around it. So um, you can generate markup or you know, you can generate something like this just using CSS. And with the CSS and JS solution, you end up with these classes that are completely unreadable to humans, which makes debugging UI issues harder. There's no class you can point back to in your code base. You need to kind of um, you know, hunt these things down. This also has another consequence. It excludes people without JavaScript expertise from the process. In my experience, people with deep specialized CSS expertise who you need on projects like this don't always have that same level of comfort or proficiency with JavaScript, nor should they be expected to. That's not their specialty. These tools exclude people who have important, essential contributions to make from participating in the process. Alex Russell is a developer on the Google Chrome team um, who talks a lot about the issues that these modern techniques create for performant rendering of websites. And in his 2018 article, The Developer Bait and Switch, he talks about a straw man argument people make to him all the time about using these tools. These tools let us move faster. And because we're iterating faster, we're developing better experiences. But I don't think that's entirely accurate. It probably improves the developer experience for some developers, specifically people who are more comfortable in JavaScript than other parts of the stack. But for people who specialize in CSS or semantic HTML or web accessibility or user interaction, it can leave them shut out of the development process in ways that they weren't before and in ways that make the experience objectively worse, not better for your users. In 2018, accessibility consultant Rian Reitfeld, um, whose name I certainly butchered, and Rian, I'm so sorry, resigned from her position as the WordPress accessibility team lead and documented why in a pretty detailed article. The TLDR is that Gutenberg, the new WordPress editor, is built on React. And because of that, and because no one on her team had React experience, and because they couldn't find volunteers in the accessibility community who did either, they couldn't effectively work on the improvements themselves. It made it really difficult for Rian and her team to do the work that they were tasked with doing. In May of this year, a detailed accessibility audit of the new Gutenberg editor was conducted. 
it was 329 pages detailing various accessibility issues and quite a bit of detail. The executive summary alone was 34 pages and it found 91 accessibility related bugs with tons of detail around them. Um, and these are not just overall bugs with Gutenberg. These are just accessibility bugs. So that whole idea that these tools make you let you work faster and thus deliver better experiences, I just don't think actually pans out that way for your users in many cases. One of my students shared this React developer roadmap with me and the items in yellow are things that are have to know according to this roadmap. The number of must know items on this roadmap is absolutely staggering. Now, in my opinion, very few of these things are things you actually have to know to get started, but this kind of thing is really alienating to beginners. Um, and, um, you know, these tools just put up such a gate that keeps people from participating in the process. There's another way we've attempted to get at this performance issue, single page apps. With a single page app, the whole site or app exists in a single HTML file. JavaScript renders the content, handles the URL routing, and so on. Only content refreshes, which uh, uh, only the content refreshes, which is uh, theoretically better for performance than having to re-download all of the JavaScript and CSS needed for a particular page in your app. I am so sorry about my dog freaking out in the background. Um, it also allows you to create really fancy page transitions, which marketing folks and clients often seem to like. But it also breaks a bunch of stuff in the browser. Um, and break stuff that the browser just gives you for free out of the box, which you then need to recreate in JavaScript. You need to intercept clicks on links and suppress them, figure out which HTML to show based on the URL, update the URL in the address bar without causing a page reload, handle forward and back button clicks, update the document title, shift focus back to the top of the document. All the stuff that the browser just does for you out of the box by default. This feels like a vicious circle. We're literally breaking features that the web gives you out of the box with JavaScript. To fix the performance issues we created with JavaScript, then re-implementing those features with even more JavaScript, all in the name of performance, which again, we ruined in the first place with all of the JavaScript. It's just bonkers. It doesn't make any sense. And our overall reliance on JavaScript has created a front end that is incredibly fragile. The smallest mistake can cause the whole thing to come crashing down. I'm sure at some point in your web travels, you've encountered something like the white screen of death, which happens because the HTML the server sends is nothing but an empty div, and the real markup is rendered entirely with JavaScript. And when that file fails for some reason or just hasn't loaded, you get nothing. And yes, it's 2019. People don't usually disable JavaScript as an integral and important part of the web. There are some people who disable it, and that's a, kind of a valid choice. but. The problem here isn't really people disabling JavaScript. Uh, CDNs fail. So in July, uh, this month actually, just the beginning of this month, uh, a bad deploy took down Cloudflare, a CDN provider that's used by 10% of Fortune 1000 companies. No CDN, no JavaScript. It actually happened twice. Firewalls and ad blockers get overly aggressive with what they block. I used to work for a company that was really security focused and they had a, a like a domain whitelist for JavaScript files. So if your JS wasn't on that list, it didn't show up. Broke a ton of sites. The absurdly large JavaScript files that we send time out on slow connections. Ian Feather, an engineer at BuzzFeed, shared that about 1% of all JavaScript requests on their site fail. That's 13 million requests a month. People browsing on mobile devices while commuting go through tunnels and lose internet. So the files don't get downloaded halfway through. Some of the page downloads, the JavaScript that's needed for interactivity doesn't. And obviously no one sets out to write code with bugs, but it happens. And when it does, JavaScript is the most fragile part of the stack. If you fat thumb the keyboard and type DVI instead of div, the browser ignores what you wrote, treats it like a div, and moves on. If you mistype a CSS property, for example, writing bg-color instead of background-color, the browser just ignores the property and moves on. But let's say you mistype a variable name in your JavaScript, uh, writing num, n-u-m, as n-m-u here. The JavaScript file would throw an error and just stop. The whole thing would stop working. HTML and CSS fail gracefully. JavaScript does not. So with that in mind, Let's explore how we got here in the first place, because it wasn't always this way. 
even as recently as four or five years ago, building things for the web used to be a much simpler affair. To answer how we got here, we need to take a quick look at the history of the front end. Historically, the back end has always had more credibility. It's where the serious business by real developers happened. The front end was a bit of a plaything. It was for fan sites on GeoCities, random musings on LiveJournal. It was under construction banners in the blink element. It was leet speak and really weird experimental layouts and typefaces and um, you know things like Doom level fan designs and things like that. It was just a really experimental, fun kind of place. It was not something where serious work happened, but now the platform is where serious work happens. It runs full on applications people can use to create presentations and spreadsheets, edit photos and videos and have real time video conversations with people halfway around the world. It's an amazing piece of technology. Many backend engineers moved over to the front end or added the front end to their skill set as the front end became more serious work medium and they brought with them a lot of their best practices. And because of our historical lack of credibility, our emerging platform maturity, and our desire to be taken seriously, a lot of front-end developers latched onto these best practices too. You hear it in things like, I need frameworks because I build apps, not websites, or vanilla JavaScript doesn't scale, or CSS isn't a real programming language. But there's a problem with applying back-end best practices to the front-end. The back-end is not the same as the front-end. In the back-end, you have lots of control you control the operating system that your code runs on. <clears throat> and when it runs, you control the storage and the RAM, and the bandwidth that's available. There's predictability. In the front end, you have no control. What we build is accessed by devices of varying capability, by users of varying experience and technical skill, on networks of varying strength and reliability. We keep throwing more JavaScript at things in an attempt to force the control that we get on the back end into the front end, but that's not how the medium works. And trying to fight the nature of the medium is the source of a lot of the pain with modern web development. With that in mind, let's look at a new set of best practices that we can use to build a simpler, faster web. What I really wanna do is encourage you to, in a way, become a developer dinosaur. We are as an industry obsessed with shiny new things, new techniques, new tools, new trends. It's what makes this profession so exciting, but it's also what causes that feeling that you can't keep up. But old techniques don't become invalid just because new ones come out. Often the older approaches are simpler and more reliable than the new ones. For example, bicycles are still a good transportation option even though cars exist. They're easier to maintain, they don't need gas, they're quieter, you don't need as much training to use one, and they can go places that cars can't. My mountain bike is 20 years old. I fill the tires up with air when they're low and oil the chain every few years, and that's it. It still works. I do no maintenance on it. I think it still has its original tires on it. Knock on wood. The same is true for development tools and techniques. That doesn't mean you should never use new tools or approaches, but I want to encourage you to be more selective about what you use and why. Does the utility outweigh the cost of using it, both for you and your users? Lean on old and trusted approaches, but augment them with new tools and techniques when it's beneficial to you and your users. So the first lean web principle is to embrace the platform. Rather than using dependencies or libraries, use native JavaScript methods and browser APIs that are baked right in for free whenever you can. Stuff that used to be really hard, like getting elements in the DOM and manipulating classes is really easy now. The first line here is some jQuery, and the second line is the equivalent in vanilla JS. It's a few extra characters, but the, um, the mechanics are the same. Grab an element, add a class. Here's some JSX that I copy pasted from the React documentation site. And here's the same thing in vanilla JavaScript. It's actually smaller in size and uses the same conventions. You can see here with JSX, you use the squiggly brackets name to add a variable into the string. With template literals in vanilla JS, you can do the same thing. It just gets prefixed with a dollar sign. Sometimes the platform provides HTML elements to handle stuff that would have otherwise required JavaScript. For example, the details and summary elements can create accordion components that expand and collapse. They're accessible, can be styled, and even emit an event you can hook into with JavaScript if you want to extend them a bit. 
You can get a native HTML autocomplete component using a humble input and associating it with a data list element. Similarly, CSS can handle a lot of stuff that you would historically use JavaScript for, animations in particular. Daniel Eden has built an entire library of CSS animations that you can poach from, and they do really, really beautiful things. And because of how the CSS ties into the, um, the device's screen refresh rate, it actually can produce some really smooth, fluid animations in a way that's very difficult to do in JavaScript. And it just does it for you out of the box for free. My most popular JavaScript plugin, the hardest one I've ever written, is a smooth scroll animation plugin that animates scrolling to anchor links on a page. So when you click an anchor link, it animates the scroll down. Uh, somewhat recently added one line CSS property now does the same thing, scroll behavior smooth. For accessibility reasons, you should disable this behavior if the user has prefers reduced motion enabled. Um, but it, you know, you click a link and it animates the scrolling down there for you and it does it in a really nice smooth way that ties into the browser refresh rate and just looks really nice and, and slick and awesome. Routing is something that browsers handle for you already out of the box and then with single page apps, we break it. So we add even more JavaScript to put it back in. The argument in favor of this is that it's more performant because you're avoiding those expensive page reloads, but there's another way to get fast page reloads and remove that complexity. Instead of a single page app, you can have a multi-page app. Um, yes, this is super old school. Each page renders a different part of your app and you let the browser handle the routing for you. You can still render content with JavaScript if you want. You just do it across multiple HTML files instead of one. And that doesn't mean you have to render all your markup server side or use a database driven website. In fact, it's probably better if you don't. And this can still give you really, really, really fast page loads. So when someone visits a web page for a database driven site, like a traditional WordPress site, the server pulls content from a database, figures out which template to use, and then combines it with, uh, with that data into an HTML file that it then sends back to the browser. This takes time and depending on your server, it can take a lot of time. Static HTML, literal flat HTML files that are pre-compiled and already exist. With those, the response is nearly instant. The browser requests a file and gets one back. You couple this with sending less code down the wire in the first place with some of the techniques we talked about already, and you get nearly instant page loads. So when someone buys one of my learning products, they get access to a portal where they can access all of their stuff. I serve up static HTML files for all of those pages. Um, and some of the stuff, the things that won't change, like the navigation, page titles and things are baked into the markup, but all of the body content is rendered in real time in JavaScript based on what they've purchased. And that information is grabbed from an API on page load. This is a video I captured of me navigating through the site. I haven't edited it or sped it up or done anything. This is just me navigating through in real time. And as you can see, it has that same instantaneous feel of a single page app, but these are all hard page refreshes being loaded completely from scratch on each page load. Um, and I get all these wonderful features baked right in out of the box. So multi-page apps don't have to be slow. In a database driven world, they historically were, but there's a lot of tools we have now that we didn't before that can make it easier to build these sorts of things and get the performance benefits too. If your site or app is just a few pages, creating static HTML files by hand isn't that difficult, but if you're managing a larger project like my learning portal, it would be impractical to code all those pages by hand. Static site generators give you the convenience of database driven sites with simpler templating and huge performance wins that you get from static HTML files. Tools like Jekyll, Hugo, which is my tool of choice, and 11D make it really easy to create many HTML files by combining templates and data together, but they do it ahead of time before a user ever visits your site. Um, and uh, just quick note on, on this, there is another talk running right now um, on static site generators and how you can use WordPress as a backend CMS for them. Um, I highly recommend you go check the recording for that one because uh, it looks like it's gonna be really good and I'm actually bummed that I'm gonna have to watch the replay and don't get to watch it live. The question I always get around this 
um, whenever I talk about kind of multi-page apps is, well, what about persistent data that should carry across multiple views? For that, I use session storage or local storage. I have a little helper function that whenever data gets updated, we'll also save it into session storage. And then when the page reloads for the first time, I grab that data back out of session storage and set my data to it. But if it exists, if not, I just create and have the object that we'll work off of um, as kind of our starting point. But this doesn't have to be complicated. Um, and and you know that's what I, I do in the learning portal that we just saw in the video a minute ago. Um, and it creates really fast experiences. Another lean web principle is to keep things small and modular. It's common practice in our industry to reach for multi-purpose tools. Look at all the utilities that are baked in. Features are good. We go for that multi-purpose utility knife when maybe all we really need is a pair of scissors. Perhaps we should instead be reaching for small focus tools that do just one thing well and only that thing and only when the platform alone won't work. Instead of including 27 kilobytes of Lodash just to use one function or two, like group by, you can include a 0 0.15 kilobyte, that's 150 bytes helper function that does exactly the same thing. Instead of loading the entire jQuery library and jQuery UI to add a toggle tabs plugin, you can load one on top of native browser methods and APIs, aka vanilla JS instead. Instead of loading 30 kilobytes of Angular or React or Vue, you can use a lightweight, more focused alternative like HyperHTML, which is less than a kilobyte after minifying and gzipping and has a very similar um, convention to React. It just uses a lot more native stuff under the hood. Or SvelteJS, a precompiler that renders your code into 100% vanilla JS to be served up to the browser. Earlier, we talked about CSS and JS. Um, and uh, using it to prevent redundancy in your style sheet by creating these separate classes for each individual property. This is a great approach, but you don't need JavaScript to do that. Object-oriented CSS, or OOCSS, was created by Nicole Sullivan quite a few years ago. If you're familiar with things like Atomic CSS or Utility First CSS, they're derivatives of Nicole's work, although she seldom gets the credit she deserves here. Object-oriented CSS treats CSS classes like Legos for front-end developers. Looking at that same component again, instead of styling the component directly, you would create utility classes for what you're trying to accomplish. Um, BG gray for background color of slate gray, text large for font size of 2M. This is effectively the same result as the CSS in JavaScript example, but with classes you can actually read and understand. And additionally, this allows people who are highly competent in CSS, but not experts in JavaScript to participate and to do things. Um, initially, this seems to result in more CSS to accomplish the same thing. And for any one component, that may be true. But once you get a small collection of these in a project, you can start to mix and match them across components to get the look and feel you want without adding any more CSS to your code base. It helps drive more consistency across the UI, reducing chances that each component might have slight variances in things like typographic scale or color. If you've ever seen a project where you have two buttons that have slightly different color values on them. Um, it's usually because two different teams worked on them at two different times and styled those components directly instead of using a system like this. If object-oriented CSS sounds interesting, Nicole has a fantastic presentation available on SlideShare that I highly recommend. And the last lean web principle is that the web is for everyone. I advocate for using the platform uh, whenever you can, but those native features aren't available on every device or every browser. One of the big advantages of libraries and frameworks used to be that they standardized behavior across browsers. But you can also do that with polyfills, little snippets of code that add support for features to browsers that don't natively support them. Here's a polyfill for the array for each method. It checks to see if the feature already exists in the browser. And if not, it uses some code supported by older browsers to replicate that modern feature. So in this case, it's using an old school for loop to bolt in array for each property, um, or uh, the array for each method, rather. Polyfill IO from the team at Financial Times is a free service that uses uh, makes using polyfill super easy. You include it on your site just like you would any other JavaScript file. Like you just drop it in a script tag. And it automatically detects the user's browser and sends them back only the polyfills that they need. So the latest versions of Chrome or Firefox get zero kilobytes. 
and someone who's on i8 is going to get about 17 kilobytes minified in gzip still smaller than using jquery or lodash or react or angular um, but with all of the features that the modern web has to offer progressive enhancement has fallen a bit out of favor lately there's this line of thinking that says that people shouldn't be turning off js in their browsers and browsers are free so they can always just upgrade to the latest one but as we talked about earlier most js failures are not because someone deliberately disabled it and People don't always have a choice over which browser they use. Progressive enhancement or building in layers adds what Jeremy Keith calls fault tolerance to your site or app and helps ensure that as much of it as possible is as usable to as many people as possible. There's a belief that it adds a lot of work that you have to reduplicate your code on the server and the, the client if you're you know, building out markup with JavaScript, for example. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. Let's say you wanted to use the GitHub API and some JavaScript to show a list of repositories on your site. Rather than using a blank div, you can add a link to your GitHub account in that element. And then when the JavaScript that you need loads, you can use the API to get those, uh, those repositories and create your markup and inject it into the DOM and it replaces that link. So if that file fails for some reason, people still get something usable, a link over to your GitHub account. People usually think about progressive enhancement in the context of JavaScript, but you can use it for CSS too. Um, CSS Grid makes it really easy to create some really innovative layouts that were either difficult or impossible in the past, but it only works in modern browsers, i.e. and older versions of Edge don't support it. But you can treat layout like a progressive enhancement. Browsers that support it get the fancy layout, and browsers that don't get a simpler single column layout. I think that's okay. In many ways, the web is inclusive out of the box, and we ruin it with the choices that we make. Our designs and code break the way that people who use a keyboard instead of a mouse to navigate move around the page. They break how screen readers consume the content. Our focus on only the latest browsers and fastest internet connections breaks a large portion of the web for people in low bandwidth countries and lower income homes. The web is for everyone, but too often we build sites and apps as if it's only for ourselves. Um, and obviously we have a diverse audience on this call, so this doesn't necessarily apply to everyone, but a lot of people who build things for the web are in areas with high speed connections and expensive devices and take internet connectivity for granted. And we're cutting off what we build for a whole group of people who aren't like us. This stuff can be hard and I struggle with accessibility often. One amazing resource is the Accessibility Project or the A11Y Project. It includes a ton of accessible design patterns and a checklist you can run through to make sure your site is as accessible as possible. I also love Dave Rupert's Accessibility Nutrition Cards. They include quick overviews of the keyboard behaviors, focus behaviors, and required HTML elements and attributes that you would expect to see for a variety of JavaScript-driven components. It's like a cheat sheet for building accessible stuff. It's awesome. Building inclusive experiences often means saying no to people, even when it's uncomfortable to do so. It means saying no to other designers or developers on your team who want to do things in a way that breaks functionality for a segment of people. It means saying no to clients who want to do something that's bad for the user. It means saying no to your boss when you're told to implement some executive's pet feature. It's hard to just say no, but you're a web professional and it's your professional obligation to speak up. Whenever I talk about building sites like this, going back to a simpler, more bare bones approach, I'm typically asked if any companies actually build websites and web apps like this. Like, this is all great in theory, but like, I need to work. Like, could I actually get hired doing stuff like this? Uh, the, the good thing is, yes, there are companies, including some very large, well-known companies that build websites like this. I maintain a list of organizations that build sites and apps the lean web way over at vanillajslist.com. It includes some pretty well-known companies. At the end of 2018, GitHub removed jQuery from their app, and instead of replacing it with a modern framework, they opted for native browser methods and custom web components. I'm a panelist on the JavaScript Jabber podcast, and I invited uh, Keith Sirkel, who was a developer on that project, to join us and talk about it. And he told me that one of their mottos internally is to build websites like it's 2005. In 2018, um, as well, Netflix ripped React out of their default front-end page load. They still use React on the server for templating, but they ripped it out of that initial front-end view. And by using Vanilla.js for their client-side code instead of React, Netflix load time and time to interactive um, got cut in half. So their site is now twice as fast. 
Meetspace is a video messaging app. They wrote their app entirely in Vanilla.js because they wanted the experience to be as fast as possible. Founder Nick Gauthier wrote about this um, in Smashing Mag, and uh, he wrote that using this approach, we were able to create an incredibly fast and lightweight application that's also less work to maintain over time. So let's wrap things up. To summarize, the Lean Web best practices or Lean Web principles are to embrace the platform, use small and modular tools, and recognize that the web is for everyone. And if you remember nothing else from this talk, I want you to remember to think like a dev dinosaur and embrace old, stable, boring technologies and techniques over flashy new ones, except where it makes sense. Let's build more bikes and fewer cars. And if this sort of thing interests you, I share lean web code snippets, tools, techniques, and more every day at gomakethings.com. Together, I think we can build a simpler, faster World Wide Web. Thank you all so much. This was, uh, this was awesome. Chris, thank you so much. That was such an inspiring talk. It was so interesting. I don't know how many of you know that as we're doing this online conference, that Gordon and I are actually doing it from the same physical location. He kind of walked in and, he, and I said, "How?" I said, Zach, why did you schedule a talk about the lean web, the very first thing during a JavaScript conference? And he said, people don't know how important this is. Most uh, people are behind on knowing how important this is. This was on purpose because I wanted to kick off the conference in a way that encouraged this sort of critical thinking. So thank you so much. I know that there, um, there were a handful of questions and, um, <laughs> and a handful of comments. I see Kenny saying, I am the old man <laughs> yelling at clouds. First talk, this is okay. Yes, Kenny, I feel seen. Thank you. Um, and uh, let's go into the questions. There was one question that I think is going to open this sort of discussion, which was from Giovanni, and it said, um, do you suggest not to use React and only using plain JavaScript, or do you suggest to use JavaScript and do not use JavaScript and only use HTML, CSS? And I'm sure that this is a point of discussion that is probably frequent and interesting for you. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, so like all things in life, it depends. Um, so I... Um, I prefer to use pre-compiled HTML and CSS when uh, when you have more static content. So for something like a blog, for example, um, I know there's been some really interesting examples um, of like I think 10up even did a project not all that long ago using the word API and rendering the whole front end in JavaScript. Um, I think that's an interesting experiment, but for me, that would not be an ideal way to to render a project like that. Um, I think it's Miriam Schwab, I think it's her name, is doing the static site talk right at the same time. Go watch the recap of that after, because she'll talk about how you can use WordPress as a CMS, use a static site generator to pre-compile stuff like that into HTML and CSS ahead of time, and just serve up a beautiful, fast, resilient site. Dynamic content. Um, I'll go back to like the video I shared with, um, with the learning portal for my users. Um, I, in a previous version of that, had all of that markup server rendered um, using WordPress. So I was pulling their information from the database and generating some dynamic markup with some conditional PHP stuff and then pushing that out to the front end. And I don't think that um, it was really, really slow just because how slow it took how long it took the server to like pull the data from the database and do all this stuff. And the JavaScript version, JavaScript render version is a lot faster. So for things like that, like these dynamically rendered user specific content, I think using JavaScript is okay. There's also certain things that you literally just can't do with pre-rendered markup, like these really amazing web apps, like, like Google Docs, um, you know, like creating like Excel in the browser, you can't do with static HTML in like a realistic fashion. Um, the real, I think the, the hinge here is like, when do you make that jump from using just kind of native methods to React or Angular or Vue? And I don't have a good answer for that because I, I've never encountered a situation where I felt like a project would be benefited by those tools. Um, I've hit a level of comfort with the native stuff, and I have kind of this collection of helper functions I use for all the other stuff that 
I can kind of whip up these new projects pretty quickly. Um, I think the argument becomes more compelling if you're working on really, really, really large applications with huge user bases like Facebook, Twitter, QuickBooks. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of some other like really popular, um, popular tools. So like some of the stuff Adobe does for like online um, graphic editing, Microsoft Office Online. I think you can make a strong argument for those that using frameworks might be beneficial um, just because of kind of the stale scale and sheer amount of data they deal with. But um, I think it's a progression and I think it's project specific. Cool, cool. Where can we find you after the conference? Uh, the easiest place, because my last name is so impossibly hard to spell, is gomakethings.com. Um, that's the jumping off point to all of my other stuff. You can find me on Twitter, email me if you want, um, whatever. Cool, thank you so much. And uh, we're good. Awesome, thank you everyone. And thank you so much for emceeing this. I really appreciate it, this is a big help. Yeah, this is fun, this is fun. Thank you so much. Awesome. Cool, cheers everyone.